Hello and welcome to our webinar sponsored by Survey Analytics. The webinar today is called How to Run a Discrete Choice Conjuring Analysis. There's a lot to cover and we believe we can teach you the core concepts on choice-based conjuring analysis and offer guidelines to run a successful project today. Um, so a little bit about Survey Analytics. Uh, we started back in 2002 and we're headquartered in Seattle, Washington. We specialize in online mobile surveys, panel, conjoint analysis, crowdsourcing, sampling, gamification, and more. And we're also one of the top private growing companies in the United States. And most notably, uh, we're number 12 on Peaches Sound Journal's Top 100 in Washington. Uh, my name is Esther Laviel. I'm a vice president over at Survey Analytics. And to the right here, you can see that our current clients include the, uh, Career Builder, McGraw-Hill, U.S. Bank, Zynga, Sony, HP, Microsoft, and much, much more. Co-presenting with me today is the President and CEO of Survey Analytics, Andrew Jeevan. Andrew comes with us with over 25 years in the market research industry with an extensive background from neuropsychology, market research, all the way to software programming and development. His articles and blog pieces can be read on uh, Greenbrook, Research Access, and much, much more. So thank you, Andrew, for joining us today. Not a problem. Glad to be here. On today's webinar agenda, we're going to be speaking about seven or eight different things here. What is a discrete choice conjoint uh, analysis? The theory and logic behind discrete choice conjoint analysis when to use discrete choice conjoint in your research, specific examples on how to use discrete choice conjoint, how to design a discrete choice conjoint project, how to write a discrete choice conjoint questionnaire, and how to analyze the results of a project, as well as some tips and best practices to have the most successful project. And we'll open up the floor at the very end for any questions. So at this section here, we're going to pass this over to Andrew to get us started with talking about what conjoint analysis is. Hi, everyone. Um, conjoint analysis was developed over about the past 50 years by market researchers and statisticians um, to predict the kinds of decisions consumers will make about products by using questions in a survey. Um, conjoint analysis in its purest form presents a series of possible products to consumers and ask them to make a choice about which one they would pick. The core idea of conjoint analysis is that for any purchase decision, customers evaluate or trade off the different characteristics of a product that might be price or package size or color or if it's car or speed or all sorts of things and decide which is more important to them. And you know, the idea is, is that in our heads we have a kind of list of things that says like to me in terms of what's important in buying cereal is um, maybe the size of the packet, uh, not so much the con content, for other people it may be fiber content, for other people it may be something to do with whether or not it's got fruits in it. But the idea is, is that consumers have a set of values which we call part worths which are estimated by conjoint analysis. Now, survey analytics uses discrete choice conjoint analysis, which um, researchers feel best simulates the purchase process of consumers. In years gone by, um, conjoint analysis was performed by writing down all the possible products on different cards. You know, the task was called a card sort. You would give this to your subject, they would then rank all the cards, and you'd have a great way of estimating all the part worth. The problem with this is it really doesn't reflect what we do. When I go to the uh, uh, supermarket and buy cereal, I don't kind of lay out all the cereals in a line and, uh, and order them and sort them because they throw me out the supermarket. Discrete choice conjoint analysis is thought to best simulate the way consumers might uh, decide to buy products by presenting them with a set of alternatives, usually three, and saying, which one would you choose? Uh, and that's why it's called discrete choice. And there, that is an important distinction. Next slide, please.
Somebody told me that all presentations should contain a puppy. So we got lots of puppies. Um, and this is a practical uh, example. You know, you want to buy a puppy. What are you going to consider? You might consider the breed, the dog breeder, the size, the price, the amount of care needed, the personality, the lifespan. These are usually termed attributes of a product that in conjoint analysis. So this is a, a good example of the sorts of things. Now, some people might decide that price isn't a factor, for instance. Or for other people, it could be personality that's really important. Uh, and this reflects the kinds of trade-offs that people make. Next slide, please. So, so here we're going. To, oh, sorry. Um, so here we're going to talk about uh, the theories and logic of conjoint analysis. Uh, basically, by running a conjoint analysis project, it'll help you evaluate new products or variations against a existing range of products already produced by your company or within the marketplace. So it's much cheaper than developing new products um, for the marketplace with no guarantee or success. Um, also, with conjure analysis, we'll be able to get real-time feedback on new projects or new products or variations of existing products. And you'll also be able to simulate the decisions of your target consumers and what they would make in the marketplace. The last thing about the theory and logic of using conjure analysis is that it'll give you an idea of how a new product can be received in the marketplace and it'll uh, give you the gauge of uh, what kind of choice, uh, what kind of choice uh, they would make based off of the choice and price relationship relative to some existing products and features that are presented to them. So basically, you know, it allows you to be able to match new products and old products and see if there's any combinations of existing products that will sell much better than what's already there. Um, in terms of the analysis, how do we come up with our numbers? Um, and for some people, um, they'll have these kinds of technical questions, happy to supply the answer. We use something called a maximum likelihood calculation coupled with a Neldermead simplex algorithm to um, estimate the part worths. We estimate aggregate part worths. We don't estimate individual part worths because of the computational problems associated with that. Although we're thinking we may implement in the longer term an algorithm that could, could get over that. Um, we have what's called design options, if you're interested in that kind of stuff. We have, of course, random, something called the optimal, and you can use your own imported design. Um, if you want to run a pure orthogonal design, and you know those of you out there who know about designs know what that is, um, we don't offer the option to generate those, but you can generate one and import it in SPSS format. Um, so you can have uh, a great deal of confidence in the results you receive. We spent a lot of time working out what's the best way to come up with the part worth values. So we're going to speak here about the conjoint analysis core concepts. And if there's anything that you would learn from our slides today and our presentation today is these four main uh, concepts. So the first one is attributes and features. The first thing you want to do is define the attributes of the products for your market. And these are the properties of your product. To the right here, you'll see a picture of uh, the Seattle Space Needle. And I'm doing this for a Seattle tourism study. And in this case, their features or attributes would be, uh, for a Seattle tourism study, would be the number of hours it would be on the tour, what time of day, and what tour type they're going to offer. The second concept are the levels. The different properties, um, these are different properties of the attributes. So for each of the features and attributes, you want at least two levels for each. So um, in this case here, for the hours, we'll have uh, three different levels. Uh, so from one to three hours, two to four, four to six. Time of day, we're going to do morning, noon, evening, and tour types. We've got different kinds of tours from a scenic tour to a weird tour to a wine tour, coffee tour, etc. The third core concept here we're going to, um, is the utility value or parts worth functions. And this is what you receive back after you run and deploy the conjure analysis. Um, and basically, they can be used to determine how important an attribute is to the purchase or choice processes in the market simulation. 
So for example, here with our Seattle tour, we're looking at the utility values of hours on a tour. And so we've got three different levels, and we're talking one to two hours, two to four, four to six. And based off the data that we received back, um, you can see that uh, two to four hours is clearly the most popular among the group that you tested. And the fourth concept here is the relative importance. Uh, you know, how important is it is an attribute in the purchasing choice decision? So, for example, of all the features to go on tour, um, on the pie chart to our right here, you can see that time of day determine which one was most chosen in comparison to hours or what the tour type was. So setting up a conjoint analysis project, I would say, kind of reminds me of putting together jigsaw puzzles. You know, all the pieces in the project should fit together before fielding the project. Um, there's a lot of planning that really needs to be done in order to run a project. So, um, so we're going to be giving you some uh, tips and tools of how to do that. For survey analytics, we offer three conjoint analysis designs. And I'll go ahead and pass this on to Andrew so you can speak about those. Yeah, we offer three designs. Uh, the first one is random. And this really means that um, our system generates a random set of uh, product configurations. That is, you know, if you have price, package size, color. And it presents um, a randomized set of these um, so that the respondents have a unique set of attribute conf configurations to be presented to each one. Random is the statisticians, if you like, pixie dust. Random takes care of all sorts of biases. Random is a good thing. The one caveat about random is that, particularly when you've got maybe a lot of levels or in a lot of attributes, um, you have to have enough tasks per respondent, and you have to have enough respondents. Otherwise, there's a chance that while you have randomly generated the alternatives, that you haven't randomly generated sufficient alternatives in, su in a broad enough way that you've actually sampled, as they term it, the problem space enough. Random's great, but you've got to make sure that you have a decent number of respondents. The next source is D-Optimal. Um, D-Optimal is a design algorithm. Um, and if you know anything about design algorithms, um, you're probably familiar with this. What this does is it looks at the study that you've got and tries to generate an optimal set of um, uh, configurations of the products, that is, you know, the, the different attributes that you have, so that it, you sample um, the problem space in an optimal way given the number of alternatives and respondents that you have. There's more information in this in documentation. And you can see this is the design where you're perhaps hesitant because of the number of uh, respondents that you've got, but you're not quite sure that random's going to give you a, a, an adequate coverage. The optimal is a way of trying to bridge that gap. Um, and it's something that's very widely used as a design. The final one is to import the design configuration um, in SPSS design format to be used by the server analytics um, discrete choice module. This is where you probably are an expert user. You probably have a very specific design that you want to use. And so we allow users to import these kinds of designs. Next slide. So here we're just going to show you how to set up a conjoint analysis question using survey analytics. Um, to set the question up, um, all random, deoptimal, and import design use the same uh, same template. So to the right here, you can see you would add in your headers and instructions, features, and your levels. So the very first thing you obviously would need to do is add in your features and attributes. And then the second thing below here is setting up the levels for each of the attributes. So in our example here, we have hours as one of the features. And then our levels, we have one to two hours, two to four, and four to six. And the second thing you would do is you can set up your conjoint analysis parameters. And the parameters basically allow you to uh, show or prevent particular pairs from showing up. So it will not display two levels that have been marked as prohibited in the same concept as a product for the user to choose. So 
in our example here, we would never do a weird Seattle tour for more than uh, four to six hours. So we would always keep it one to two or uh, two to two to four hours, and this pair would never show up to the respondent taking the survey. Third item here is the concept simulator. And this is mainly used as a guidance. It can be used to determine what choices will be presented to the respondent when the survey is actually deployed. And this is used mainly in the random uh, design. So you can see you know, approximately how, what number of times a particular pro uh, feature or attribute will show if you were to uh, talk to 25 different respondents. In the optimal design, this is where you can change that. Um, you can go into the settings, um, and then you'll change the design type into the optimal and select uh, the version type. And then you can save your settings, and then you can see what's going on. Um, the minimal uh, for versions uh, is always going to be 5 um, as the lowest or higher than that. If you attempt to go any lower than that, an error will per be produced. Um, so you always want to start with at least with the with five or higher. Um, Andrew, do you have a, a explanation a further explanation why that's always? Um, I believe well, it's statistical basically. Uh, we generate different versions so that we have what's called different experiments uh, going on, and you really don't want to have too low a number of versions, as otherwise you're using a, what's called a fixed model. Um, so I, I think we'll have to put that one down to technicalities and efficiencies. Thanks, Andrew. And here is with the, uh, the optimal design that kind of shows you the different tasks that um, are able to uh, be shown during the time uh, of uh, review. And then you can uh, move forward and then deploy as needed. The third option here, of course, we have is the import design. Um, so it allows you to design um, the product or the prod format in SPSS, and then you can format it into uh, survey analytics. And it's basically like uploading the file and then just specifying what task versions and uh, concepts you want to show. So um, we, can, we can assist you with that. We also have a help file that can work with this as well. So here's a quick preview of what a conjure analysis uh, survey would look like to a respondent. And also a conjoint preview with pictures if you'd like to add some pictures to it as well. And I just wanted to go really quickly live into survey here. And I can show you exactly where all this is exactly. Um, the first one here is just with the random design. And you can see that you would add your headers and features. And then you can click on your settings. And you can see the design type and your respondents. And then you can review your choices there. And you can see uh, on the next one is the de optimal design, where you can go in. And the template is exactly the same. And then you can change the settings and see that it would have all the updated designs and everything as well. And then, of course, with your import design, if you select that, then you can go in, select your headings, and then import as needed. So we also include a download template that you can use, and then import your design as needed. So I'm just going to go and run through just a quick simulation here to see how quickly you can do this. One of the great things about the conjoint that we have here at Survey Analytics is that you can create a very complex survey to go along with your conjoint analysis. It's all together. It's not a separate piece. And then you'll be able to look at all of your data all in one area. So they just simply go through the cycle, or select the task counts that you would like, and so forth. I'm just going to go ahead and close that. So we're going to, uh, the next section here is uh, we're going to talk about uh, reviewing the data. We're going to look at the utility calculation and relative importance. 
relative importance, uh, as Esther mentioned earlier, gives you um, a very clear idea of what attributes the respondents found uh, the most significant, what influenced their choice the most. Here you can see, uh, and it renders it as a, a percentage, you can see that we have tour type giving us 45%, and that's the, the largest percentage there, followed by the hours of the tour, followed by time of day. Um, and this kind of thing, this kind of analysis is, can be very useful, obviously, when you're trying to work out um, what one factor or two factors within your product um, influences purchase decisions. Now, if we take um, this example of the output from survey analytics, um, it, here we see a relative importance again of the tour type of 45.97%. So this is obviously the most important attribute. And the utility or part worth values now show us that the uh, weird settle tour is good uh, with value of 0 0.64. Uh, second down there is uh, chocolate. So it's 0 0.583 followed by uh, the wine tour. I'm a bit surprised wine is less popular than chocolate. Uh, and then the coffee tour. Now, in terms of the time of uh, the hours of the tour, which is the, the first line here, we find that um, two to four hours appears to have the highest utility value, making that the, the most popular um, uh, time to spend on the tour. Next slide, please. Now, the system will also show you the best and the worst profile. profile. That is, the best and the worst combination of levels of the attributes. So here with the best profile, we have two to four hours in the afternoon between 3 to 5 p.m. and it's the weird Seattle tour. The worst or most unpopular one would be four to six hours in the morning and it would be the Seattle scenic tour, which is a pity because Seattle is relatively scenic. Over to you, Esther. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, the next section we're going to be talking about is the market segmentation simulator. And this is where you're going to be using existing data uh, from contra analysis to uh, do some uh, simulation work. And basically, uh, it gives you the ability to predict the market share of new products and concepts that may or may not exist today. And it allows you to measure the gain or loss in market share based on changes to the existing products that are in the current market. And so uh, there's uh, three important steps that you should do when you are using the conjoint simulation. Um, the first thing is to describe and identify different products or concepts that you want to investigate. And uh, we call those profiles in our system. So for example, uh, if you want to set up a first profile here of the tour type, we were picking out the weird tour. The number of hours is one or two hours in the time of day we want to do an evening tour. And then we want to uh, find out all the existing uh, products that are available um, and see how that changes if you set this profile up against other profiles. Um, the second thing is that you want to uh, find out all the existing products that are available and then simulate you know, all the market shares um, of the products to establish kind of a baseline. And the third thing is to try out new services and ideas based off of what you've added in your features and attributes and see how the market share might shift uh, based on new products and configuration. Uh, working with my clients, I have found that you know this is actually the, the funnest part. And sometimes people think that the conjoint uh, some, the conjoint uh, tool or the question itself is where you can ask these questions, but the truth is really the simulator kind of gives you more uh, in-depth opportunity to take what they've already answered and kind of dig and drill down more without even really having to deploy another survey. So that's really the fun stuff here. So to get started, all you need to do is uh, you know, click on your online tools underneath the analytics tab, and then you want to set up the uh, name simulator profiles, and then you can change your profile. So, um, so you can see here, you can select from all of the features and attributes that you've set up earlier, and you can have up to 10 of them at one time. And once you set those all up, you can click on save profile changes or run simulation to see your results. 
so here's the results of the simulator output defined. So um, below here we've got an example profile of uh, the hours being four to six hours on both one, profile one and two. And the time of day is the exact same. The only thing that we changed that was different here is the weird Seattle tour and also comparison, comparing it to the chocolate tour. And you can see that our simulation output shows here that based off of the number of people who've taken our survey, um, the first profile with the weird Seattle tour is clearly the winner um, compared to uh, the second profile. And so you'll notice that, you know, even if you know if you change certain things like the time of day um, or the number of hours, uh, you can see maybe there's some market share differences. So now that we know all these different things, what can we find out with the market simulation simulator? And I'll have Andrew come in and help me with this. Uh, we've set up a quick uh, example here. You know what happens if you have a tour of one to two hours as opposed to four to six hours in the afternoon for a, a weird Seattle tour. Yeah, and the results clearly show that the one to two hour tour would would attract about seventy five percent of the market share. Actually, what it's telling you is that um, that combination has a total utility value there you can see of 7.58 and it's saying that it prob the probability of purchase of that is 75% uh, within your uh, population and it's important to remember when you're doing any sort of uh, study conjoint or anything else that the results are as good as the sample that you have of the population out there in the world that you're going to be uh, sending this product to. Next slide. Thank you. So here we have our, just some quick tips for a successful conjuring analysis project. And uh, one of the main questions that people come to me uh, when they want to start a project is where to begin. Um, they don't really know where, where or how to define, define their features or attributes. So I always suggest them just using some uh, good old-fashioned market research uh, techniques. You know, it's good to start off with some qualitative research first, and they can define what those top attributes are, and you know, what kind of range you're planning to use, and what kind of language are you using to define these uh, features and attributes. Um, some things such as like a focus group study um, or more open-ended questions in a online survey will help to find those top attributes needed for your study. Other tools that you can use is like a crowdsourcing tool like Ideascale where you can ask people questions and they can vote on what the, the uh, features and attributes that are most important to a certain product. And so, you know, there's lots of different things, but this is uh, where you would start um, to help define where those features and attributes are. And then you can continue on with using some uh, quantitative data that you collect through surveys and um, other methods. And that's where you can really start to define those features and attributes. Okay, the commonest question uh, when it comes to running uh, discrete choice conjoint is what sample size do I need? Um, the quick answer is as many as you can possibly get, uh, given that they have the right characteristics, as I said before. Um, the sample should reflect the general population as closely as possible. But of course, this sample size question has come up very frequently. And Richard Johnson, one of the uh, inventors of uh, Conjoint, presented a kind of rule of thumb here. Uh, and he's got this little equation, NTA slash C greater than 1,000, where N is your number of respondents, T is the number of tasks they do, the number of choices they make, A is the number of alternatives per task, so that's you know two, three, four. We really wouldn't recommend going higher than four. And C in this case is the largest number of levels for any one attribute. So, you know, your attributes may have a number of levels. One might be two, three, four. Uh, in that case, you would put four C equal to four. So if you have 500 respondents, three tasks per respondent, two alternatives per task, and the maximum number of levels on an attribute of, of your attributes is three, you get um, the result down there, which is a thousand. 
Now, this is a rule of thumb, and of course, you can't always do this, but generally speaking, sample sizes tend to be 200 or, or, or up to 1,200. It's a wide range, admittedly. Um, 300 seems to come up most of, often for a single homogeneous group of respondents. And I'm going to say it again. It's very important to select the sample so that it reflects your population uh, that you think are your consumers. Um, that really is the key to the validity of any study, uh, discrete conjoint or, or anything else. Next slide, Esther. Thank you, Andrew. And some additional practices and tips um, for using surveys with conjoint. Um, you want to make sure that you keep your options clear and as simple as possible. Um, don't do any more than 20 trade-off exercises and no more than uh, five or six attributes. And try to keep those range, ranges very simple. And you can ask more intimate questions of current customers than potential customers, um, but don't let that stop you from trying. And this is just being able to get some more open-ended, deep-ended questions, because you know, um, I've learned that from uh, as a technique from other uh, research uh, professionals in our area that you know anyone who's a loyal customer can really give you some very interesting insight and that can help shape future products that you're looking to create. Um, in general, also follow good online survey techniques and make sure to test your survey before you deploy it. And again, keep it clear, uh, keep it, the responses very clear and also let them know that it's strict, strictly confidential and keep your surveys 15 to 20 minutes long, and if needed, uh, make sure to provide an incentive. And so here we want to talk about uh, the uh, survey analytics discrete choice conjoint versus our competition. Uh, we do know that there are other people that are offering uh, conjoint analysis, um, but what makes survey analytics so unique is that we do offer uh, flexible pricing it's probably one of the most user-friendly conjoint models in the market. It offers real-time reporting, and um, the pricing is also included in, into an integrated research tool that can enhance your efficiencies and depth and uh, research strategy. So, you know, you, for one minute you can run a survey with conjoint or you can run one without. Um, there's a lot of different options here. So um, if conjoint is not just the only thing you do, um, you can still uh, use the software platform for other uh, research strategies that you're looking to deploy. Um, in addition to that, you also have a, dis a dedicated account manager and support will also be included. We help you and train you with setting up your first project so you understand each point and each feature and what you can do with that. And we're here to help you answer questions um, before, during, and after your project is concluded. A question about if survey analytics is able to provide individual utilities. At the moment, we don't provide uh, the ability to calculate the individual utilities. The algorithms you do that are rather intensive. However, we are researching, and we're trying to see if there are some other um, algorithms that we can use that may be able to give this. Next question is, do you have the ability to do a split sample design to cut down on respondent fatigue? Um, that can be possible using the A, B testing, but I think there's an issue with merging that. Um, to cut down a responder fatigue, really, um, the key issue is to minimize the number of tasks that you provide the respondent. Next question, uh, can conjoint be used in decision making in real estate investment options? Uh, certainly, conjoint is, uh, discrete conjoint is a good technique for any sort of um, decision making process involving purchase. Um, if you can render the various uh, attributes in a real estate investment uh, purchase, then you can use conjoint. The question is, my understanding for classical conjoint is it can micro-model utility values for individual respondents' discrete choice. Conjoint can only macro-model. Our discrete choice, uh, as I said previously, can only macro-model. That is, we provide aggregate values. Classical conjoint is the card sort uh, variety, or that is what everybody regards classical conjoint as. Really, um, that's something that's no longer used very much. 
So out of discrete choice, um, the options are really to use something like hierarchical Bayesian um, analytics to provide the individual utility values, and we don't provide that at the moment. The question is what would be the minimum and maximum number of attributes or features that can be tested in conjoint analysis? There really is no minimum or maximum. The real issue with conjoint analysis is one, can you get an accurate sample of the population that you wish to model? Two, respondent fatigue. You can provide people with lots of choices, they can have lots of uh, features and there can be a lot and, and there and there can be lots of levels of the attribute, but um, respondent fatigue sets in. And it is important to remember that you're trying to mimic real choices. People seldom make choices based on eight attributes. They usually boil those down to a few. So it's important that when you're producing your discrete conjoint task that you actually do mimic real world decision taking. Question is, is D-optimal design something like orthogonalized? No, it may produce an orthogonal design, but it may not. It really is just an optimization and trying to pick the, the, the really optimal uh, levels of the attributes to ask to get the maximum amount of information possible in the minimum number of trials. Um, and so, as I say, it isn't like orthogonalization, but it may produce an orthogonal design. Question is, can you briefly compare main effects only technique to a technique that includes interaction effects? As the question implies, main effects will only show you the strict main effects, say, of the different attributes. You won't be able to work out if a level of one attribute interacts with another level of another attribute. Um, can you briefly compare main effects techniques to a technique that includes interaction effects? Um, it doesn't provide you with information on any interactions between the levels. That is, there may be a level in your um, attribute one uh, that has an effect on a level on attribute two when those occur together as a choice. You can't pick up that information with a main effects model. If you need to do that, you uh, have to have uh, a more structured design and analysis than we currently have available. Question, does your simulator handle different demographic slices? Uh, we will be putting that facility in very shortly, uh, the ability to segment within the analysis and show different demographic slices. Question, is the simulator an online product or a downloadable deliverable? At the moment, it's an online product. Question is, to do conjoint analysis, do you need an entire Cervantics license or can you purchase just the conjoint analysis utility? With Cervantics, it's an all-inclusive package. So the basic standard license includes as much conjoint analysis as you need to run. Question, have you used this methodology in political candidates research? Could it be applied? Certainly could be applied. I'm not able to give you any reference as to how it has been, but I'm quite sure that uh, somebody has used it for choices in political uh, uh, elections. Question, what studies would you run before a conjoint? Typically ones that will allow you to identify the important attributes of a product. Uh, products have many facets. Um, using conjoint to filter them out can be very wearing for the respondent. So you'd really want to run some sorts of uh, surveys or research to work out which parts of a product people tended to concentrate on in their choice behavior. Question, could you tell me a little more about the market share simulator? Do you have an accuracy numbers for your predictive model or is it something that is really dependent on the analysis we put into it? Um, the accuracy of any of these kinds of um, measures is really to do with, as I say, the sample that you have of the general population. Um, it's quite possible to produce um, market share calculations that will quite simply be wildly inaccurate if you don't have uh, a representative sample of the target population. Question, my client wants to understand how their new serial will do in the serial are. How do you test the whole competitive set when there are only two attributes are really SKU and price? Um, give them a series of choices. Um, you, there's no lower limitation on how simple that um, a conjoint study can be. So thank you all for joining us today for our presentation on the conjoint analysis. And um, we hope that you had a, a wonderful time listening in on this. And Andrew, do you have any uh, last words? 
uh, other than to thank everybody for attending and uh, thanks Esther. Thank you very much.